Well, welcome everyone to the Carolyn Lee PLLC monthly webcast, where I invite special guests uh, in the EB5 space to have an informal conversation with me about EB5 issues of interest. And they may be um, issues across the board. We've had webcasts uh, that are very narrowly focused, like better understanding how TEAs or targeted employment areas work, um, the webcast on the new redeployment policy update over the summer when the revision came out in July. Uh, I'm super excited today because this is the first ever webinar webcast event where my guest is an investor. Um, and there's truly no better person than Bhavesh to um, speak to issues particular to Indian EB-5 investors. Um, I think the situation for Indian EB-5 investors is very, very interesting. It's very complex. And because of the number of um, active, big EB-5 policy legislative developments happening right now and in the last couple of years, um, Indian investors' EB-5 situations are going to get um, more dynamic even than they are today hopefully um, better in some respects. Um, and so we're gonna, the purpose of our webcast today is to just kind of tease those questions and issues out and um, to get our viewpoints on, um, on some of those issues. So um, thank you so much for joining us everyone and Vivesh, thank you for agreeing to be here. Thank you, Carolina. I appreciate you invited me and um... Uh, just to give you a little bit more background about myself. So I came to US in 2008 and uh, I, was, uh, I was on H1B visa when I was first time landed in the US. I worked for uh, same company which I working for working in India and they put me in a US location. Now, when I, when I came here, I was not knowing realization about the uh, H1B system, how the green card system works. And, that's a similar scenario for most of the people coming from the India. They don't know exactly how the U.S. situation, how the U.S. green card system is working. Right. Because ultimately, you came here, you stay here, and then you like the country, and then you want to find your ways how we can be permanently living over here. Yeah. And that's where your search gets started over that. Yeah. Now, when I file my, so ultimately, I file my. I-140 application for a green card, and it was in uh, 2013 where I decided like I want to stay in this country and uh, the process gets started in 2012, 2013, I got my I-140 approved. Mm -hmm. Again, that time I was not worrying about how the backlog situation looks like. I was not looking into it, studying it. Then after a couple of hours, I realized like, okay, these are the complete mess because you have a very large backlog exists and uh, there is a country cap limit where you cannot you cannot get a green card for X amount of number of years. And that is something I started realizing in 2016, 2017. Yeah. So I was looking for uh, how we can address that. Now that time, my biggest worry factor was my daughter. And that's a very common problem for most of the Indian people who are coming on a H-1B visa here. Uh, my daughter was going to be age out. And I was more worrying about that situation because uh, as, a, as a parent, you don't want your child to be aged out and you child can face the same situation which you have been gone through. So that's why I was started looking for different options like how we can address this situation. And uh, so somewhere around 2017 middle, I came across to EB5 solution. Mm -hmm. I was started looking into the searching different kind of options. I was reading it, what I can do. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I almost study around six months, like whether whether I should go for it, I should not go for it. Yeah. There was a lot of confusion over there. Yeah. Now, the biggest confusion on my point of view is if I'm going for an EB-5 solution and tomorrow if the country cap bill, that's a lot of active groups are working. If that passed, then what will happen? Yeah. That was a very confusing moment, at least from a, my point of view. Mm -hmm. And uh, that time in 2017, 2018, when I was searching for different options, the biggest problem was there was a very limited information available on the internet. There oh, are so that, many individuals. 
about the per country cap bill specifically or about no, no I'm, I'm i'm talking about the eb5 okay. so eb5 almost all the websites if you visit then you visit the lawyer website you visit the regional center website they talked about the project right. but right. there was no there was no common uni means common people where we can trust and we can find the unbiased information right. that type of source right. uh, was right. not available only one source i personally study that is a suzanne's blog mm -hmm. so that blog was my was my eb5 textbook and that blog i try to learn i try to study and try to understand what she's saying and but that was a real textbook i would say when i was searching for that project gotcha. now so finally, I decided to go ahead and invest because that was a very confusing moment for me, whether I should jump in or I should not jump in. But yeah. finally, I decided like, okay, let's go ahead and jump in. So what, so I think what, it, what pulled the trigger for you? What was the tipping point where you decided to jump in? So I think the money was not an issue. Money was an issue, but it was not a major concern. But the major concern, for, at least for my side, was a country cap bill. Yeah. Because if the country cap bill is passing, that means I will be behind the, all the Chinese investor as an Indian investor. And if the bill is not passing, that means I might have a superior chance where I can get the visa through EB-5 out. And certainly compared now, with EB-2. Exactly. Right. Compared to, because EB-2 timeline was showing 35 years for me. Right. My priority date was in 2013 and based on estimate calculation, it was showing 35 years. Right. Now, probably I may not survive by that time. So I yeah. might die. So... Yeah. Yes, exactly. So there was no point, no meaning. And the, and the bigger threat was my child is going to be aged out. So child will be on a same day one point where I started. Right. So I, ultimately I said like, okay, whatever happened, let me put my foot on a both step. Either this will pass or this will pass. That right. was a tipping point And that was a decisive point where I decided like, let's go ahead and jump into the EB-5 solution. Right. And I'm pretty sure a lot of H-1B people right now India, on an Indian point of view, they have this similar kind of questions, like whether we should jump in or we should not jump in. Yeah. The money isn't concerned for a lot of members, but again, there are in Bay Area, the pay, salaries are very high. So people are earning good money. If they were really want to stay here, they can definitely find that money and somehow they can manage it. But the bigger problem is what happened to the country cap bill. But ultimately, for, for my point of view, the tipping point was just go ahead and make the decision because either EB5 will work or EB2 or EB3 will work. That was the decision. Mm -hmm. I did it. And ultimately, it turned out to be a good decision, at least at this moment. I don't know what is going to happen in the future, but it's been a three years and nothing has been happened on that front. Right. So, yes, that was the point. Now, I already applied for the, I already applied for the uh, EB5, but then after the bigger problem started on my point of view is where we can get more information because... Yeah. The investor was completely decentralized because they were just talking through a one common source, either maybe on a Twitter, it was a very limited information and probably going through the uh, Suzanne blog and writing out the comment and that's how the communication was happening. There was no real communication was happening that time. Yeah. So then we figured it out and decided like, why don't we go ahead and start some kind of group where people can join, get together, meet each other and they can do the live communication. So I think on March 13, 2018, we created this group. That's so, that's the first day. Yes, that was that was a group created. So March 13, 2018, if I remember. So that day we created the group. We initially, uh, some of the investor get joined, but then after some of the real professional get started joining. For our audience, excuse me, Bavesh. For our audience, Bavesh is referring to a Telegram group of investors. Um, it's it's informal. Uh, but it has hundreds of participants. It's a four to 500 uh, member group where information is exchanged exactly as Bavesh is saying. Go ahead, Bavesh. Right. So we have a, we have a few investors started uh, joining with each other and uh, we started communicating. Now, luckily, we have some very good professionals also joined. One of them is the Matt Gillard. He's a very respected person. He also joined. He, and then a couple of more professional get joined. They give us a background how the system is working. They, they, they give started giving the input from industry standpoint of view and the investor. So investor and professional started talking with each other. And mm -hmm. right now we have a, so much information in the group. Yeah. If somebody need to look at the past history and check it out, then pretty much I mean, whatever. I, I, I must say, I think that um, that's been striking. The, the quality and the sophistication of the information exchange. 
um, is really quite remarkable. It's very database. It's there are citations, there are links to websites. Um, it's uh, there's of course place for opinion, and I've noticed that there is candid exchange of feelings as well, which I think is very positive and healthy. Um, but there's just a, a, a high quality information being exchanged. Absolutely, I think the I think the the seat from one of our uh, co-admin member. He also created a very nice Excel spreadsheet where pretty much all the informations, whatever the FAQ sections and a couple of other things. So whatever difficulty we as an investor faced three years back, new yeah. investor do not need to face the same yeah. problem. Right. So, so that's that's the point. That's the whole purpose of the point. But I would say yes, that was my story. Now I'm still waiting. Right now my 526 got approved. I already filed my adjustment of status, but I'm waiting in the queue to pass and approve the AOS application at this moment. Got you, got you. Um, and of course, after your adjustment of status is approved, you'll be a conditional permanent resident um, once your adjustment is approved. And then after two years in conditional residency, you'll be making another filing with USCIS, the I-29 petition to remove conditions. So you're about halfway in your immigration journey. <laughs> Absolutely, yes, exactly. Just and, and, and the big, bigger threat is there are so many bigger threat ahead. One of the yeah. things that I'm going to ask you, that is something about the Senator Grassley bill. Yeah, So Yeah, so that is, that is something, the per country cap bill. So there are so many hidden factors are there. So I don't know whether this is 50% journey completed or 20% journey completed. I hear you, I hear you. And if we... If we start back from, was it um, was it 2013 you said or 2011 when you started when you came on an H, your your immigration journey. 2008, yes, 2008. So this is like 13 years now. So yeah, so your journey in U.S. immigration has been let's just say too long, too right. long. Um, um, so let's start talking about Senator Grassley's bill. Um, somebody in our uh, audience has asked for the Telegram link. So, um, Bhavesh, uh, at some yes, point. Yes, I will, I, will, I will provide the Telegram link. Okay, okay yeah. wonderful. So, yes, you will get the link. Um, let's talk about the grassley Leahy bill. I mean, talk about um, the big questions, why people are um, on the sidelines waiting um, to see some of these bigger pieces and how they settle the per country cap bill. And certainly now, I think uh, the question that's pressing on all of our minds, investors, projects, prospective investors, old investors in the pipeline is what's going to happen after June 30, 2021, um, and which is when the EB-5 program will, sun the regional center program will sunset again. Um, and it's been sunsetting after these short intervals since 2015, um, when Senator Grassley, Chairman Grassley then, first introduced his EB-5 reform bill, S-1501. Um, so in terms of um, the question asked about um, what specific provisions in the bill um, are of interest to investors, uh, just stepping back from that a little bit, um, this bill would change the EB-5 program. And in that way, it's, um, it's in the history of bills, EB-5 bills that have been circulating and introduced since um, around 2015. Before that, uh, when the program was first created in 1992 as a pilot program, not a permanent program, but a pilot program, the regional center component of it, um, it was reauthorized after sunsetting um, the EB-5 Regional Center program was coupled with other immigration programs, E-Verify and the Religious Worker Program. E-Verify program is a program that would require in, um, employers to verify employee work eligibility through the USCIS database system. And the Religious Workers um, is a program that allows certain religious workers to apply for a green card. Um, and EB-5 was one of it was one of those three pilot programs, and those three pilot programs would be renewed um, regularly. Now there were some irregular irregular years 
when there were gaps in federal government funding, as happened recently, a couple of years ago, when the program would lapse. And there was a period of time when it had lapsed for um, a fairly significant period of time, months. Um, but it was attached to those programs and they, it would just be renewed regularly without substantive change. That all changed in mid 2010 um, when with S 1501 most notably, and that bill um, proposed to fundamentally change the EB-5 program in the way that it was overseen by USCIS, a lot more requirements for oversight and significantly in the investment amounts and the way the targeted employment areas were defined, TEAs. Uh, there was a lot of criticism about the way TEAs, high unemployment TEAs were being drawn. Critics of the TEAs thought that gerrymandering enabled areas that were posh, not poor, to be designated as TEAs. Now, my own view really quickly is that I think that that criticism is um, not well founded because, because when you're talking about high unemployment and lowering the investment in threshold to increase employment, you have to look at labor patterns and labor commuting. So it's not just, you could have a fancy area, but that fancy area isn't um, pulling its labor pool from people who live in that fancy area. So right. you, have, you have to look at the data that tells you where the labor lives. And that is actually the Bureau of Labor Statistics data that they go by the place of residence and not by the place of work. So if you do that, then you actually find that TEA maps uh, may under report um, the employment impacts in terms of the economic impact of, um, of that particular project. So um, in any event, those reasons drove then um, Chairman Grassley to introduce this um, bill, which would greatly change the EB-5 program. Um, it was controversial, as you could imagine, and ultimately it did not pass in 2015. Subsequently, there have been other bills in that vein to significantly overhaul the program. And um, there have been softer bills um, that would introduce reform measures um, and seek to try to thread the needle more on the TEA definitions and on the investment thresholds. Um, yeah, so um, it is the current Grassley-Leahy bill is, is in that trajectory, is in the history of reform bills. Um, and uh, this bill is different from those other versions in that we don't deal with the TEA and the investment amounts at all, because those issues have been taken up in regulations. So we all know that USCIS published final regulations in November 2019, and those regulations took care of those issues, if you will, took them out of um, the legislators' hands because the regulations affected an investment increase, significant investment increase, and also change the high unemployment uh, TEA definition right. to one that's narrower. Um, so this bill is only about what we so-called, what we call, what we all call integrity. It's about increasing monitoring and, uh, and oversight of the regional center program. And so um, it's been about where do you draw the line? Um, mm -hmm. Because you, we all want integrity, we all want to empower USCIS with greater authority to oversee the program because we want the program to run well. We want only good people. And by that, I mean um, people who will run the program responsibly and assure to the best of their ability that the investors are going to um, get their green cards if the statutory and regulatory requirements are met. Um, so, uh, and of course, investors want that as well. Um, it's a balance between giving USCIS the tools it needs to ensure that we have integrity in the program and also not burdening the regional centers unduly with burdens about reporting and um, overseeing parties that it may not control um, in ways that are unreasonable, perhaps not doable, practically speaking, impose fees and additional costs 
when um, those me when those measures um, may uh, not balance out with um, the additional enhancements to the program, or at worst, not meet the goal. In other words, not be effective in um, enhancing integrity in the program. So that, as advocates, that's the balance that we've been looking at um, to make sure that, to the best that we can, that the program has integrity, transparency, reliability, so that all of us can have greater faith in the program, yet allow the regional centers to operate reasonably so that it, can, um, it has transparent rules with which to work. Um, and it is not so overburdened with requirements that practically will be very, very difficult or uh, impossible to meet despite their good intentions. Um, and in terms of this particular bill, it strikes that balance in my view, having worked on the bill uh, in, the, um, in the best way uh, that we've been able to um, as compared with prior efforts because we've been able to insert the concept of reasonableness. So that means um, where regional centers in earlier drafts of the bill had strict liability. You know, if you have a third party um, party involved in your project, recruiting investors, and they're not your employees, you don't have control over them, and they do something that they oughtn't do, the regional center would be held strictly responsible and suffer uh, the penalties, the new penalties in the bills, suspension, termination, for example. Well, that we didn't think was quite workable because you're punishing the regional center and its investors because if there's termination under the current material change policy, the investor's immigration status would all be unwound unless they were conditional permanent residents. So investors like Yubavesh, who are in the process and not yet conditional permanent resident, if your regional center were, God forbid, terminated, then your approved petition would be rescinded. We right. don't want that. Um, so uh, we were successful, and this has happened over rounds of advocacy. Um, but in this one, we were able to um, ask for and get reasonably um, the concept of reasonable oversight commercially reasonable conduct on the part of regional centers um, in their new obligations. So again, they have these new obligations, but they're not gonna be held to a standard that's impossible to uh, abide by. They'll be held to a commercially reasonable standard. So I think that this is um, tremendous progress for regional centers as well as investors. Um, another very noteworthy thing about this bill is um, subparagraph M, um, which would to section two, um, which would add on to 203B5. It would be 203B5M. Um, and this is uh, the good faith investor protections. Um, and the good faith investor protections in this bill are new and they are the strongest that industry has been able to negotiate. Um, and they would protect uh, good faith, meaning investors who are not involved in um, any wrongdoing. Good faith investors who are facing um, terminated regional centers uh, or debarred new commercial enterprises and job creating entities who are debarred because um, they had actors in there that are now precluded under another section in the bill, uh, good actor sections in the bill. Um, so if those actors are out or if they um, conduct or if they fail to report things that they're now required to report, um, they may be, uh, they, the regional centers, NCEs and JCEs are now subject to termination, debarments and, um, uh, and suspensions. So what are investors supposed to do? Um, they didn't do anything wrong. Uh, they've been waiting in this process for a very, very long time. Um, well, the good faith investor protections would allow them to keep their immigration process going. Uh, okay. And 
Yes, and so not suffer um, a rescission or a revocation of their 526 approval or a denial of their 526 petition if it's pending. In addition, there would be other benefits, priority date protection, um, if you end up filing a new petition with a new project, priority date protection, age out protection for your children. So one of the main reasons why you undertook the investment, could you imagine the investors who took, who jumped as you did for their children um, to be pushed out of their EB-5 because their regional center is terminated. That's, that's not a result that we want. So uh, protecting uh, investors' children from aging out in that situation. If the, if the project recovers other money and um, that other money goes to creating more jobs that are needed for the project, that can all happen. So um, I think that the new um, investor, good faith investor protections in this bill um, are, uh, are to be celebrated. Um, right. And, uh, and uh, I feel quite, quite good about that um, from the standpoint. So is there, any, is there any advantage on a, so one thing is a five years reauthorization, that's a good sign for investor, but yes. is anything bill is covering regarding the uh, USCIS processing time? Is there anything covered in that bill? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, so first of all, right, one of the things that this bill would do is reauthorize the program for five years. Um, there is not on um, processing times. There is a section that requires the agency to conduct a study, a self-study of um, what it needs, how it can achieve certain processing time goals. Um, and, and they're very reasonable, um, you know, uh, I can't remember them off the top of my head, but they're like 180 days, 120 days if the project is in a TEA. So quite workable. Um, however, the statute does not require USCIS to abide by those processing times. I see. Okay. And I'm glad you mentioned that, Vivesh, because um, I, it's, it's not about the bill. It's not covered in the bill. but Indeed, um, enhanced USCIS processing times is what we all need because the longer the processing times are protracted, the greater risk that we have. Like you said, you know, maybe the rest of your EB-5, maybe you're halfway through, maybe you're only 20% of the way through. And a lot of that depends, and a lot of that depends on USCIS processing times because even though your 526 petition is approved, if the per country cap bill passes, um, then it's uh, it's it could affect um, it could affect other cases, uh, the thousands right. of cases that are still pending, um, and the per country cap bill that it was under consideration in the last Congress would have a two year delayed effective date. But if your case is pending for three years, right. then you're, you're, even with that delayed effective date, you're going, going to, to you're, you're going to come under how that, how that bill operates. So um, I think that uh, if we don't cover it later in the course of our conversation, it has to be that the common advocacy thread that joins us all is we need to advocate for more efficient EB-5 processing times at USC. So let's say, let's say, let's hypothetically assume like this bill is not passing by June 30. Yeah. What will happen to existing pending 526 and I-485 application? Yeah. Oh, good questions. So um, we have some precedent for um, these situations um, and fairly recent precedent as well. Um, so it is USCIS's view that if there is no funding for the program, if the, fund, if the program lapses, then it is not authorized to handle those cases. So if, it, if the, any 526 petition is filed after a sunset, and there's no reauthorization, those cases will be rejected. For the pending cases, it's pens down. 
they are not going to, they're likely USCIS examiners are not going to work those cases until there's reauthorization. Um, as far as um, uh, how the, if there is a, if the uh, lapse in reauthorization gets protracted over let's say months, um, the service in the past has held those EB-5 cases in abeyance um, pending reauthorization, um, after which they may reject those cases or um, adjudicate them under direct EB-5 rules, which would mean no indirect jobs, only direct jobs would be counted. Um, so that would be very, very problematic. Um, interestingly, 829s, if an 829 is pending or filed during a lapse, in the past, USCIS has said that uh, they would continue to adjudicate the 829s even when there's a lapse. So those cases might be okay even under a lapse. Um, and in terms of visa issuance, the State Department in the past has said that they would continue to issue visas uh, until the close of business day. In this case, um, it would be June 30th. And port of entry, if you get a visa on June 29th and it's valid for six months, um, is it good for your entry in August if we don't have a program then? And um, CBP, Customs and Border Protection, um, has said that it would admit, it would let you in until for the validity period of the visa. Now you also asked about your pending adjustment of status application. Um, I, you know, you know what, I, I'm not sure if the service addressed the 485s in the past, but I'm going to um, look that up and I will um, include an answer to that when we send out any follow-up um, with links to the video and so forth to the audience. Okay, good. So my next question to you is, there is a, there is a lawsuit going on for a recent regulation. Now, do you think like, is there any chance like the EB-5 investment limit will go down back to 500,000K uh, for new investor? Is there any possibility? Oh, man. Wow. Um, I mean, anything could happen, right? Um, I guess, in theory. Um, and I know that the advocates for that litigation very much believe in it. And they uh, think that there's a good shot and all of that. Um, I, I don't see it, Bavesh. I don't see that happening, going back, especially going back down to the 500K level. Um, because then, uh, what would happen is, well, first of all, I think, I think the theory is very interesting. Let's go, let's talk about the theory uh, behind the litigation is um, the prior Secretary of Homeland Security um, was not formally confirmed by the Senate, which cabinet positions are required to undergo. And you may remember there was a succession of um, secretaries in the Department of Homeland Security under the prior administration. So I think there was a lot of shuffling and new um, secretaries uh, and uh, his confirmation did not happen. Chad Wolf's confirmation did not happen. I so, see. so the theory was because um, Chad Wolf did not, was not confirmed, all of the regulations promulgated while he was uh, DHS secretary are invalid. And there was litigation, un, not EB-5, but um, other litigation that was successful on that ground. I see. Okay. Um, the, the question with, with this, um, there, are, there are questions in my mind and others about whether that argument applies to this particular case um, but we'll, we'll see, we'll see how that goes. So anything is possible. Um, if, if that litigation is successful in unwinding the regulations, um, I, you know, I, then what would happen is then that issue of the investment amounts and TEA definitions will 
may be taken up again by Congress and try to be folded back into EB-5 legislative proposals, in which case I, you know, I think it could get messy again because that, that it, it caused so much strife within the industry uh, that uh, it was very difficult to try to achieve unity, which um, the Hill leadership, which uh, Congress said, you know what guys, it's very hard to pass anything immigration related and if you want to have a shot at getting your EB-5, your precious EB-5 bill passed, you better get your own house in order and come together and at least not fight each other. And yeah. that way you're at least asking us to get something passed that you are all in agreement with because it, it, you know, even then it's, it, it'll be hard, but it's, it's not gonna happen if you guys are not together. So, um, I, there's been great progress made on that, on the industry front. Uh, there's more of that than there ever was. Um, and so I guess then the question would be, if the, if the, if the litigation is successful, um, then, and the, those issues get thrown back into um, Congress for EB-5 bill, um, where will the industry, how will the industry react to that uh, is the question. Right. So my next question is, uh, you must be knowing like 526, 485, even the EAD application in 829 on anything you touch is on the EB-5, it is taking a very long time. So what is the advocacy you recommend so we can improve those timeline which USCIS is currently taking to processing this application? Yeah, um, I, think, I think that we in EB-5 are very lucky in that um, USCIS has, policy that would prioritize non-backlogged cases. And um, there, it just in last March, uh, 2020, USCIS came up with new policy that said, um, we're going to adopt a new approach to processing. It's not gonna be first in, first out, which you know, they've got, we know they've, they've got um, 18,000 cases that are pending. Instead, we're going to take cases where there is no visa backlog. And we're going to prioritize those cases and process them first so that they can go into the visa queue so that the visa, um, visa usage could be optimized to use their language and perspective. Um, so, and I think that's different from other categories where I think USCIS is, um, is probably more compelled to follow a first in first out system. So I think we have, um, we have everybody, the entire immigration eco space is advocating for USCIS to get more efficient and improve its processing times, right? Everybody's doing that. And under, with the new administration coming in, that advocacy will be renewed and in, it, it'll, that will happen. Specific to EB-5, I think that um, we have additional arguments in favor of USCIS efficiency because um, we have that internal USCIS processing protocol where they said themselves that they would prioritize non-backlogged cases. Um, and, uh, you know, I think this, the second argument that is near and dear to my heart in EB-5, but um, I think other categories have it as well, is as you know, um, we had we had 121,000 visas, additional visas coming over to the employment-based side this year from unused family-based right. visa categories. Um, so, and this was due to COVID consular closures. And the EB-5 portion of it is 8,000. Uh, when our category is backlogged, um, gosh, using those 8,000 visas in EB-5, especially since we lost so many last year already, we lost about 6,000 to COVID closures. So we to, to use up those visas, those additional visas as efficiently as possible is, of a huge, huge, huge benefit to us. And I would say of a particular benefit to Indian investors as well, because um, 
if you look at the visa office's statistics, there are 5,000 plus um, visa uh, applications that are pending in, uh, in the EB-5 IPO backlog, in the USCIS backlog. Um, so that means that while um, India is current now, but um, we're, once USCIS actually does start processing its cases, whenever that is going to happen, and also depending on the pace of their adjudications, I think we're gonna see a surge in Indian investor demand for visa numbers. And we all know that there's a 700 per cap, cap per cap on um, visas in EB-5 before cutoff is introduced. And so I think depending on how quickly um, uh, USCIS does process those cases, um, I think we're, we're going to, I don't know when, but there is a bubble of cases behind us. I don't know when it's going to, re, you know, like flower. Um, so we have to we have to do all we can to uh, optimize and to use those additional visas um, as many of them as possible. We can't do that. Yeah. Some some of the EB two and EB three applicants are currently getting the EAD application processed in three to four months, but we have a lot of people in our AOS group. They're waiting since almost a year now to even not receive the EAD application. So right. that is far more, uh, I don't know how long it will going to process 485 application, yeah. but there is nothing has been done on an EAD front also. Right. So it seems like all these additional visa this year, we are getting it, most likely these are going to wastage. So how, what we can do so we can bring up this issue to the correct people who is the right person we can pass on this message like there is a, some kind of discrimination is going on against the eb5 visa category well i think that um i think that there are things you can do um one thing is um you could uh i mean it, it requires a certain level of organization which i will assume um and then uh i, I mean uscis itself has portals and communication channels, which um, I will also include. Um, there is the Office of Public Engagement. Um, there is the USCIS Immigrant Investor email box as well. Um, and so there are channels, there are stakeholder meetings, stakeholder uh, public calls and meetings where they take questions from the floor. They also, when they hold those stakeholder meetings, which the prior IPO director, uh, Chief Sarah Kendall, said that, um, that they would be held um, at least twice a year. Um, I think uh, we certainly haven't had one yet this year. Um, and I think they were starting to, to implement that last year. So we'll see whether that'll continue this year. But when they hold those engagements in advance, um, they ask stakeholders to write in comments. So I think that's yet another opportunity. I think um, getting visibility with existing advocacy groups is also doable and recommended. So for example, American Immigration Lawyers Association, AILA, of which I'm a proud member, um, is, has established channels. Um, now those channels have not been you know, have not um, have been closed in uh, the prior few years. Um, the hope is that they'll reopen, and um, if and when they do, um, to be able to you know align your investors' advocacy with the bar's advocacy, the lawyers and the lawyers represent your interests, so they're represented in that way. But to do that more directly, I think that there is an opportunity for that. And also organizations like IIUSA, um, which represents regional centers and uh, other trades, including advisors, lawyers, um, it, investors, this, it's not a, it's a trade organization, but, um, and I can't speak for them, but I would think that, um, I think that uh, there is, you know, uh, there is, um, 
an opportunity to at least ask whether um, groups would be open to somehow hearing from and folding in investors' concerns. Right. Okay. So do you think like we can reach out to IIUSA and we can get some kind of help from IIUSA to bring up this issue? Well, I, I don't know about um, getting, uh, I, I don't know, I can't speak to what would happen, the outcome, but I think you should 